This is a University of Otago podcast. Hello, welcome. It's nice to see you all here as opposed to standing out in the rain wanting, trying to get into New Zealand's Got Talent. <laughs> so I think this is where the talent is today. Don't quote me. Um, um, welcome. Is that feeding back a little bit? Is that all right? Is that all right? Yeah. <clears throat> It's good that we've all wet our own. We can just let it flow this afternoon. Um, um, the University of Otago fellowships are something to truly celebrate. It's a unique um, institution in New Zealand. And um, I'd just like to start by reading you a small extract from Landfall 1959 when Charles Brash wrote the following in relation to um, what ultimately the, the, um, the Burns Fellowship, which, which was the first, uh, was all about. He said, part of a university's proper business is to act as nurse to the arts, or more exactly, to the imagination as it expresses itself in the arts and sciences. Imagination may flourish anywhere, but it should flourish as a matter of course in the university, for it is only through imaginative thinking that society grows materially and intellectually. Charles Brash, 1959. Um, from your right, we have um, David Howard, the Burns Fellow, Hannah Briggs, the Karen Plummer Fellow, Leonie Agnew, the. Oh, one moment. I've got to get this right. He knows what I am. Yeah, I know what you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know this is very long. <laughs> University of Otago College of Education, Creative New Zealand Children's Writer in Residence. <laughs> Samuel Holloway, Mozart Fellow. Zena Swanson, Francis Hodgkins. Good. <laughs> so what, this afternoon we'll just meet the fellows, so uh, I'm just going to throw it over to them and we'll start at, um, you're right, David, just uh, briefly um, I'm going to ask the question um, how you came to be here, what your, um, basically briefly your sort of career path which has led you to be sitting um, in the fellowship now. This is my career. <laughs> this is the only time in my life I've been able to put the word career and poetry together. They've oh. been enemies up until now. <laughs> I feel enormously thankful to have received the burns, and one of the reasons I'm thankful is not that I join um, a rather forbidding crew like Janet Frame, James K. Baxter, Morris G. It's that I don't have to think about making money for a year. And not having to think about making money for a year in itself lets me open up internally and make connections and attend to other people's work in a way and with an intensity that I can't normally do. Because like almost everyone in this room, and certainly like my colleagues, a lot of the time I am necessarily, quite appropriately, and not resentfully, you know, chasing enough money to keep the power on, to pay the phone, to make sure that the kids have clothes. Well, designer clothes. <laughs> and that dissipates my ability to really give my best to the work. And so for most of my life, I have found that my desire to make poems has been shoved into the mornings or the evenings. And that's time normally when most people are attending to their partner and the chores around the house and their children or their parents. And I guess the point I want to make early on in our discussion today is that what I learned, particularly in my 30s, when I spent almost all my time making money and very little time making poetry, is that if you make art, you do so out of an act of compassion, but that act of compassion engages selfish parts of you. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's unpack it quickly. I think making art, bringing painting, a composition, a dance, a piece of literature into the world is an act of compassion towards the world. I think it's a virtuous act in itself, regardless of the content of the work. 
But I also think in order to give your best to the formal vocabulary of being a poet, being a composer, being a choreographer, you need to protect your time to make the work. And that means that you actually find yourself pushing partners away and cutting short time with children and being short with your father on the phone and actually engaging in ways that are not virtuous, that are selfish, that are narcissistic. And it's a continual battle to balance your responsibilities to the wider community and your personal community and your responsibilities to the work. And the Burns has let me do that in a way that's <laughs> unbelievable for me. And I guess this is the, the high point, really, because I don't expect that, that I'll get this opportunity again. So the Burns lets me say poetry is what I am, poetry is a career. Unfortunately, there's a period at the end of that sentence. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, um, I've been dancing my whole life. Um, five years ago, five, no, more than five, 2007, I decided to finally uh, take the plunge and um, become, uh, I guess, almost a full-time dancer. Um, so I did my Masters in Dance Studies. And during that time, I got the opportunity to work with uh, um, Carolyn Plummer fellows, such as Su Susan Cohen and Lynn, Lynn Pringle. Uh, and I've always really enjoyed participating in their projects. Um, it's yeah, just really fun and, and worthwhile experience. So uh, I knew that the Carolyn Plummer was something that I would love to do. Um, and I guess uh, I was in Melbourne, living in Melbourne for six months, and we decided to move back to Dunedin uh, unexpectedly. So I thought, well, I'll apply for the fellowship and see what happens, and I got it. So, um, yeah, in, in very short, that's that's how I got to be here. Yep. Mm. Leonie, what's your story as to you know your journey as an artist? Oh, whenever um, I get asked to talk about my or write usually a bio, I, I make things up. Okay. I do. Um, have you not got a story? Oh, no, well, probably not. That's the thing is, it's much more exciting to make things up. Um, and as a fiction writer, I actually get asked by children, is it true, did you write your novel with invisible ink? And things like that, which I have actually stated in various places. And they look really disappointed when I tell them the truth. But I will stick with the, with the truth. Um, I've been writing since I was seven. <laughs> you know, as soon as you can put a sentence together, most writers will tell you that that for them is without trying to sound like it's a big deal, it's just reality. You write because it's something you enjoy doing from a young age and you just don't stop. And hopefully at some point someone tells you you're good and even if they don't, you keep doing it. Um, I've been to many different workshops and things along the way, but I would be, goodness me, trying to fix on an exact point to say where things begin is hard, but um, uh, my background was in advertising and writing television ads and radio and that certainly was a turning point when you learn how to brainstorm into a 60 second um, capsule and it means you cannot look at your creative director and say sorry I don't have any ideas you must say here it's 60 ideas I hope you like one of them um, and it also teaches you the first lesson of writing which is kill all your little darlings so that was probably a very important turning point for me because it taught me to be very particular with my choice of words and it helped me to start um, doing proper plots and structures because I'd been writing all the way through but never ending stories. <laughs> um, then when I was 30 I decided it was time for a change because if I wanted to do more than writing on weekends I was going to have to knuckle down and accept that I needed to change my career path. So I am a primary school teacher, not just because of that, but it, you know, it is a particular career that does work in nicely. I can do relief work, I can do you know, all kinds of different arrangements with teaching, which will work in and around my writing, which has been really good. And basically, um, the more seriously I took my writing, the more seriously it took me. And um, yeah, basically, I always saw this advertised in the um, NZSA and the weekly newsletters. And I used to think, wouldn't that be nice? And if I ever get to apply for it, it won't be for another 10 years. But I am very much at the start of my career. I've only been published the first time a couple of years ago. And I was lucky enough that it, it won some awards, which I believe would have helped my application. <laughs> so <laughs> last year, I thought, what, what the heck? I'm a finalist. I'll throw my hat in the ring and, um, and hope for the best. And the best happened. So here I am, and everything that David said, 
times two. <laughs> um, it's just the opportunity to write and to be taken seriously as a writer is quite weird. I was saying before, I've done interviews and things. It's very strange. <laughs> it's been brilliant. Thank you. <coughs> Lovely. Thanks, Leonie. Samuel, your journey as a composer, how has it come about? Uh, well, I started learning the piano at a very young age, uh, but uh, I was pretty hopeless. Uh, and I've always been a pretty hopeless performer. And I think that's why I started composing uh, when I was at uh, high school, um, with the encouragement of some uh, very encouraging uh, teachers. I can't remember why I then went on to study at university. I mean, it seems like such a bizarre decision to make. I have no idea what I was thinking, um, <laughs> basically. Uh, but, you know, at age 18, you know, we all make funny decisions. Uh, so I studied for a while in Auckland and uh, upon completing my study I spent some time in Wellington and then returned to Auckland and I've been teaching for uh, since mid-2008 at uh, Unitech in Auckland and throughout that time I have managed to keep working on uh, my practice and I never thought I would come to Dunedin, I never thought I'd apply for the Mozart Fellowship. Uh, I always, I guess, thought that I would move up cities, so I'd move to a bigger one, not a smaller one. <laughs> um, is it a, but that is, that's not a joke. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that was, I, I just didn't think that's what I would, mm. never crossed my mind that that would be the right thing to do. Uh, but working in a tertiary institution uh, has some, you know, some great things about it, but some certain demands also and uh, well I've been working for any large organisation has particular kinds of demands uh, and I guess I came to a point where I realised that I needed to be spending more time on uh, my writing and this seemed like the best opportunity to do that and it does remain the best opportunity if you want to spend a year working on your uh, practice in, in New Zealand there's simply I mean, there's a few other opportunities for composers, but uh, there are certainly not many at all, and this is the you know the best one. Um, so I decided it was the right time, and I applied, and uh, here I am. See <laughs> now. Um, I studied sculpture at the University of Canterbury, and um, since graduating, I've exhibited around the country, and um, you know, I've had various studios throughout Christchurch and lived in Auckland uh, following the earthquake where I lost um, my studio and all my work. So it's the second time I've actually applied for this, the fellowship. Um, and, yeah. mm. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question of you all, and that is, um, to do with the, the, the creative process itself. Um, for example, where do you start? Do you start with an empty canvas, manuscript, whatever, you know? Um, um, and, or does it, is it based on some sort of inspirational thing, or do you have to just lock yourself away, because you have that opportunity, so to do in this particular part of your lives, and that, 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 that's about discipline, I guess. But where does the creative process start, or how do you find it, or how do you actually make it work for you individually? Start at your end. Um, I guess it varies. Yeah. Often, like lately, it's just been walking to the studio. It takes about half an hour, and I often see things along the way that will inform the work I make. Or there's a particular book that I'm really interested in called um, The Secret Life of Plants, mm. um, written in 1976. It sort of delves into um, pseudosciences to do with plants having feelings and um, yeah, some of those aspects of that research have informed some of the new work I'm going to make. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. but I guess it, it varies. varies. Yeah. What about you? Uh, yeah, I, I guess all of my work starts with some kind of um, non-musical idea or concept, um, formal idea. Uh, but yeah, that comes from all sorts of places. Um, I have far too many ideas and uh, I actually find it a real problem when I'm 
reading something or watching something or just experiencing day-to-day -day life that uh, I constantly have ideas for work and what I do not have and what I've been trying to focus on this year is the time and the discipline to turn those ideas into the, the finish, mm. the, the work. So actually, the, most of it for me is just hard work, not necessarily particularly enjoyable work. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, yes, it's never an easy question to answer um, because as everyone said so far, um, inspiration comes from many places and it's often hard to pinpoint. Um, to simplify, I could say that most writers usually say they either start with a character or an idea. Um, I start with an idea and then sometimes other ideas come and join and they start a story. And when they don't, then they stay on my computer until they learn to behave. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have Samuel's problem in that I have way too many things to finish and that's one of the great things is the opportunity to focus. I do have discipline, but when you're working on too many things, you can have all the discipline in the world if you don't have the time. Yeah. You know, it's difficult. I'm not completely undisciplined. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't actually mean to no, no. that you were. <laughs> I just mean I've got a, I've got a systematic approach when I'm at home. But I have found that um, I like to work between two or three projects at once. Um, and I've now managed to get myself into the situation where I have a good seven stories, which is ridiculous. <laughs> you have to finish one thing and move on to the next one. Do you find that, for example, as a writer, you have a little notebook and you, as a little idea pops into your head, you've got four I've little a new one. <laughs> one four notebooks. So and none of them are finished. What does okay. it tell you? Yeah, yeah, okay. Book of ideas, yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of different for you, Hala, the way you would work, or...? Um, sort of. I think the beginning is similar. I'll have an idea and um, it usually doesn't begin with, a like, a movement idea or image, but... Uh, maybe more con more of a concept yeah. um, and that could come from reading a book or meeting a person or some kind of work I'm engaging in um, but it comes to me um, and I have notebooks as well I have many notebooks uh, tucked away where I scribble things down uh, and then when I get in the studio it's really about um, bringing that idea to life and I do that by working with people um, I've never really been one to um, lock myself in a studio and choreograph by myself. I, I find that quite difficult. Um, I like to work with a group of people, um, usually with a diverse range of embodiments, um, and I work collaboratively and see what, how they might interpret my ideas, uh, how they interpret my movement, um, and it kind of formulates from there. And um, I must say, I find walking really um, great for choreographing and coming up with movement ideas. I, I'll walk and have my headphones on and just, it just sort of comes. So I've, I've had a great week for that this week where um, I'm having a showing at the end of August and the dance kind of just slotted into place in my head. So that, so that was exciting. I always sort of wait for that moment and it's kind of nerve wracking until it happens, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> David. I once spoke to an airline pilot and uh, he said to me, oh, look, my job's a doddle, but it's, it's got two bookends. There's the takeoff and the landing, and that's six minutes of terror at each end. And I think that poetry for me is, is the six minutes of terror with no doddle in the middle. <laughs> so it's 12 minutes of terror, 12 it's, minutes. it's 12 hours of terror, it's 12 years of terror. I start feeling worried that I'm never going to have an idea in my head. I'm never going to be able to bring that idea into contact with another idea. I'm never going to be able to generate any sentences that are worth reading, that say anything about the human <clears throat> condition. And that's an aim of mine. I do think that literature, because it uses language, and language is the history of being human. This is just a logical description, by the way. This isn't an assertion of faith. You go to a dictionary, you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, you see that this word entered the language in 1586, that we used by such and such, and in 1630 it changed its meaning slightly with another usage, and then by the 19th century it had almost turned on its head and the original meaning had taken on a pejorative connotation in the 19th century. So language is the history of being human, therefore when you use language you say things about the human condition, even if you're trying to write the most dardest nonsense, <coughs> you still are saying things about the human condition, inevitably by using language. I worry that I'm not going to be able to say anything worth reading. 
Now, who would my readers be? That's the next question, as I'm sitting in front of the blank page. And the primary reader, in fact the only reader, I can afford to care about is this one, me. I write for me. Now that's a terribly selfish admission, but it seems to me the only honest place to begin the discussion. I make all the judgments about what stays on the page, and many things don't stay on the page. My first drafts are chaotic, <coughs> and, and one of the things I say to my younger colleagues when they're complaining about how hard it is to write anything, I say, look, you just put it all down, no censor in the first draft, you know. Let strange things come together, you know, unwieldy concepts, put them all down. And then you edit. And so my mornings are about the fear of the empty page. And then by lunchtime, it isn't an empty page, but it's full of garbage, actually. <laughs> and the afternoons largely are about taking the nonsense away so that I can see what can be built on and turned into a piece of work. And that process is repeated over four decades, really. I'm quite comfortable with my process, but I hope I'm not smug about my process. I no longer get scared about the chaos, but I do get scared, as I said at the start of the statement, that I'll never actually have an idea anymore. That, you, and some days, of course, you, you think, oh my god, it's happened. I'm really stupid. I can't think of anything. The best thing to do in that situation, and I'm perhaps picking up on my colleagues here is you get on a bus and you eavesdrop on conversation. Or you go to a cafe and you eavesdrop. In other words, you take yourself out of your own problem and you attach yourself vicariously to other people's problems. And because they're using language, it feeds back and I can build on it. Mm. Mm. That's good. Um, David, you said there that you write initially um, for yourself. That's your sort of starting point. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you all that question that your creative process who do you have in mind do you are you writing for an audience for yourselves for your public or and does that affect the way you actually create or is it, or is it, or is it, or is it something that, that changes as you go are you are you are you creating for yourself it works on paper definitely but just um, for you yeah a lot of the time the sculptures um, I use materials to often dictate an architectural space which forces people to engage with it in a certain way. So in that respect, I mean, I'm still making it for myself, but also having a really strong consideration of how people will negotiate it. Mm. And often, <coughs> I often use plants that have certain symbolic meanings. And um, I made a work which was a, a wooden slatted structure <coughs> Um, and it had stinging, growing stinging nettles down either side, and it was quite a narrow space, so it made people feel quite anxious about. Yeah. 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 So no one got stung. No, okay, good. <laughs> I did. Yeah. So I remember one uh, Mozart fellow sitting here saying that um, that he actually didn't care about his audience. He was writing purely for himself, and if they happened to enjoy it, then that was good, but that was not what he was doing for. Sorry, that was a previous fellow. Hmm. Who do you write for? Yeah, look, I think it's a, it's a difficult question, and um, I'll probably wish to contradict myself once I've yeah, made a on. statement okay. um, about this. Uh, I suppose I am quite reluctant to make assumptions about how an audience is going to, or how a listener is going to um, experience my work. So I think I, I don't wish to be arrogant in making assumptions about uh, how people are going to experience my work. Um, that said, of course, there are certain things you can, you can know a certain amount about what, how things are going to work. Um, but having to make sense here, aren't I? Uh, I mean, when it comes down to it, what matters is the work and the best working out of the ideas to make something that is um, satisfying in a way for me. Yeah, but you're, but surely um, part of a composition is a performance, and to have a performance, you've actually got to. It's actually got to be for somebody other than yourself, doesn't it? It's, it's not about you then. Uh, Sure, it's not, I mean, it's not really about me, <laughs> anyway. Um, it can be about you if you want it to be. Don't, don't feel put off. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's nice to have an audience, yeah. uh, but it's not, uh, I, don't, I don't... 
I'm not, I don't write for an audience. Yeah, I don't write with an audience in mind. Really? Okay. So, so would you be quite? I mean, does that not? But would become rather dull ultimately, wouldn't it, if you're just writing and writing for the sake of writing and never having the. Isn't music written to be heard? Well, I'm, sure. Yeah. Per perhaps. Yeah. I mean, I. I <laughs> Most of my work has, has a notated element, and that, yeah. and I'm quite. I think there's an argument to be made about the how that music exists as notation without it being realised in performance, okay. and that's yeah. a that's another argument which I'm not going to try and make now. <laughs> um, but I also trust myself in that uh, I, I feel like I. Well, I mean, I question myself all the time, but um, I only have myself to. Um, I've got to write for myself. That's sure. the, the best judge of, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what I do, and perhaps that might um, <coughs> work for some people, um, and it might not. Mm. Mm. So, do you write for an audience? Do you so so that <laughs> if you you get enough satisfaction out of just creating something and putting it in the bottom drawer? Hopefully not that. in the bottom drawer. Not in the Hopefully bottom Hopefully on the shelf. <laughs> on the shelf. So if it's, it's going to go scenario. on the shelf, if it's going to go on the shelf, then you are writing it for somebody else, then aren't you? Um, it's, it's a sense of satisfaction or I think you're confusing the end product with the motivation to create. Okay. Um, it's systems and I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and... Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll just turn Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I just said I think the motivation to create is different from the end product and you can enjoy different stages in the creative process without necessarily moving away from the fact that there is something intrinsic in creating anything that is personal. And I think if you begin by looking at the audience first, you can lose yourself and what your motivations were and a really important part of what you're doing comes from here or here. <laughs> Um, that doesn't mean that I don't have a respect for my audience, their children, you know. Um, it does mean that the first time that I read to children, I got a real shock. I was honestly, it was like, oh my goodness, this is a book. You know, children will read this. And I must admit that last week I went to McAndrew Bay and I was reading uh, my first picture book to children. And I did have a moment thinking, is this something that I need to consider going forward? Because my way of looking at my own you know, writing process can change. Is this something I need to consider? I'm looking at these children's faces and do I need to think more about what they want? And I've heard librarians say that, you know, like dismiss certain works which have been critically successful and won awards because they're not successful in terms of popularity with children. Um, some things just don't reach out to the children but they reach out to different demographics. Um, and all I can really say is that I'm open to it. I'm open to the possibility one day of saying, okay, this particular piece, I've kept in mind very clearly a certain nine-year-old girl, <laughs> and is this going to make her smile? Um, but I don't think so, because I'm afraid as soon as I do that, as I said, I will stop thinking about what, what I think is the best. And it's what um, Samuel said about being your own inner critic. I read a lot of children's books. So my inner critic is actually um, Frank Cottle Boyce and um, Roald Dahl and any other children's author that I hold in high esteem, really. That's all I can say. Mm. Yeah, I, was, I think I start definitely start with myself. Um, and, you know, there's an idea that I'm curious about and want to explore more and uh, want to learn more about. And, and so it definitely starts with something uh, intrinsic uh, but then if I am choreographing for a performance, um, there has to be a point for me where I consider the audience and how they're going to read my work. Um, so then I will start making decisions uh, about the choreography um, that I think will be hopefully more appealing to watch. So that's when the process comes in of um, editing, uh, deleting, adding, adding things. Um, and really trying to view the work from an audience perspective. Yeah. And if you were working in Australia last year, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Oh. So your audience would have been, if you were doing work for them, it might be different. The end product might be quite different from the audience that you, for the same sort of work that you might be doing here. So you're, 
taking them into consideration as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if I worked in Australia long enough to, oh, okay. to get that sense, but I would say so. Mm. I think it would really depend on, um, I think you do have to take an audience culture into perspective. Um, I went to one show that was uh, in the Israeli group who uh, toured to Melbourne and I was probably one of the only English speaking uh, people in the audience and, and they right at the start they made no apologies that, that their entire show was predominantly in, in Hebrew um, and to just laugh when everyone else laughed. And <laughs> but it was enjoyable to watch and, and they did in that, in that regard, they did consider their English audience members um, that continued with their show um, in the way that they had made it nonetheless. Mm. Yep. Mm. So you've said that you're still, you, you I hope to expand out from the self. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope there are concentric circles from yeah. from each poem. Yeah. But the thing is, I have colleagues whom I admire, but I admire them with a reservation. And Glenn Colquhoun would be one. And I worked with Glenn, and Glenn stayed at my place. So if Glenn was here, he could argue against me. It works like this. For me, Glenn starts with quite a clear sense of the audience he's trying to reach. And he modulates tone as he's writing to reach that audience. He puts an internal sensor on, and he makes a judgment about who his audience is. And he winds up his poem much as you wind up a pop song. And the thing is, it's a tin plate for making work. And I find that condescending. Mm. I can see Glenn getting really angry with him wanting to have him. Fair enough, because he's not here to... But I think that's condescending. I'm closer to you, Samuel. It's like, I don't know who the audience is. I don't know what you value. I don't know what your stories are. I do know, logically, that most of you won't enjoy my work. And actually, that's fine. Because you'll go to another author, hopefully, whom you do enjoy. I'm, I'm quite relaxed about people picking up a book of mine and going, you know, I, I don't really get your stuff, and putting it down and then going to Sam Hunt, to Glenn Colhoun, to C.K. Stead, to Ian McEwan, to the crime novel, to whatever. I don't see that writing as some kind of Olympic sport where only one person crosses the line first. And in fact, I can, I can prove that. I invite you to go to your bookshelves and see how many authors are there. I bet you there's more than one. So I'm quite comfortable that most people won't like my work. That means it would be foolish for me to try and guess the tastes of those who might. It'd be ridiculous. What a quixotic endeavor, how to tilt at windmills. Surely I can, I can open opportunities for a reader by following my own hunches. And that's actually all integrity is. When people talk about artistic integrity, what they mean is the practitioner follows his or her own hunches. They back themselves. You have to. Mm, to thine own self be true. Um, good. So if that's the sort of starting point, I'd like to uh, explore when a work is finished and how you know when a work is finished. Oh, and when you hard. put it there you go, it's hard, yeah? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's easy to know, but it's hard to explain. But do you, do you stop when a work is finished? Oh, hmm. well, sometimes I put something down. Yeah. For a while. Because it's not finished? Because it's not finished. Okay. And it needs more work. <sighs> and I don't know where to take it, but... Um, usually you know. Usually I know. Okay. Yeah. Do you know when you've finished a work? Uh, I guess you can keep pushing an idea though. Mm. When I'm yeah, working on sculptures I yeah. can come up with one thing and then, you know, end up with screens and screens of drawings. Right. With the various ideas that you could do, but then you decide on one. Mm. one. Sadly, I usually know a work's finished because I'm a week or two past the deadline. <laughs> uh, but luckily, that tends to actually match up when the work is with when the work is finished. Okay. Um, but yeah, you just you sort of know. Oh, that's 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 lovely if you do. Do you know when you finished a work? Yeah, um, but it is difficult to explain because it's like listening. You know, the difference between hitting a glass and hitting a crystal, but it's some true. kind of time. <coughs> yeah. But I do like putting manuscripts away and coming back to them. So until I can do a full reading where I'm quite happy, even if I'm mistakenly happy, <laughs> if I feel happy and I can hear that tone that I'm looking for in the language and the flow, um, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for me, I never really feel like a dance is finished. I always, even after a performance, I always think about how I would have done it differently. Uh, but I do, um, yeah, I do have to get to a point where I'm satisfied enough with it that I feel like it's okay to put on stage. Um, and in you know, so I always have that deadline of this is when the performance is, so we have to get it ready, you know, to feel good about it being on stage. But it never, never feels finished for me. I would love to continue working on the same work. So is that tinkering or is that actually developing it further? Um, sometimes it's tinkering, sometimes it's developing it further, so it'll often completely change. Um, but I don't think I ever really get a chance to do that or haven't done so far. I feel like I'll, I'll do a work and we perform it and then the next thing comes in. And sometimes it's like a related theme. Um, so in some ways I am developing that particular idea but just in a different direction. Hmm. Oh, it's a relationship breakup. The work dumps me. Oh, does it? <laughs> yeah, I walk into the office, you know, and the work says, you know, you're a great guy and we've had some nice times together, but, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm pursuing something yeah. else. And it literally walks out on me. And I'm, you know, I'm advancing arguments why the work should stay and it's gone. And then I go around fretting and feeling grumpy and sad. And then I meet someone else. <laughs> and we're on. <laughs> Because a, um, a, a playwright, and indeed a composer too, will often have their work performed and then do reworks, do further further uh, additions or whatever. So yeah, I, a, no. I tend not to. I think it's extremely healthy just to learn when you need to, to, to let go and move on and get Write on with the next work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and mm. I don't think it's a particularly good thing to start going back and culling things from your back history and so on, um, it's just, you just keep, got to keep moving forward, I think. I'm just laughing because there's a chapter that I usually read to children from Superfin and I actually always add a line. I just oh. add a line and it's one in the book <laughs> because I wish I'd written it now. <laughs> and it always gets a laugh from the kids mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so to some extent I have learned something from reading out loud but I'm still learning. And I was also going to say I'm really glad I don't write series fiction. Um, maybe one day I will, but because I've seen the schedules on series fiction, if it's really tight, it's three months of writing. And as I just said, I, that's it and it's done. I like to put things aside and then come back to it. It's a very tight turnaround for a series writer. So come back to it, and how often would you come back to a work till you were, until it's finished? Depends. I don't know how, how, how many it? numbers equal infinity. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'd say yeah. years over each thing mm -hmm. and probably 100 times, 200. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is that frustrating that, that, or is that just part of the journey? It's only frustrating when it's not working. Okay. If you are tinkering and it's not working and then you have to just put it aside and go on to something else and hope that three months down the track you'll come back to it and you'll see what was wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've got a few things that may never be right. They're like that old car that some guys keep in the garage and tinker. <laughs> One day it might actually work. Yeah, yeah. Um, the um, the fellowship which you are all participating in um, is a year long or six months, um, and you're all at Otago University, um, which is not home to any of you. No, you are. You are. Yeah, two of you are. Um, there has. There's no collaboration going on, I think, between any of you. Is that right? Not yet. Oh, not yet. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to collaborate with? You don't know yet. I'm actually doing a children's book to music with a, <laughs> with a lot of art and dance involved and maybe a poem at the end. Okay, well that's, that's, I'm glad we met together today. Yeah. <laughs> because there is, there is surely opportunities um, for that kind of thing to occur. I know that David, you've done work with, with musicians on the other side of the world. Um, would it be nice, would you, have you got the headspace to at least consider that kind of thing with with another fellow? I'm not asking you to do it, but would it be a nice idea that the fellowship could be a stimulating place for that kind of Yes, it is, because working with a practitioner in a different area 
is more threatening and I therefore think more rewarding than working with someone in your own field. I see no point whatsoever in two writers working together, to be quite honest. I think it's, it's kind of like having two bricklayers on the job for one, one small wall. I mean, they'll build it in half the time, but what the hell? Whereas if you, you, know, if you want a, a property that's going to be well developed, you get someone who can put the roof on, not two bricklayers. You get a bricklayer and someone who can put the roof on. So a composer, a painter, a choreographer, is inherently more interesting to me. And my collaborations, as you correctly point out, have, have by and large been with three composers and two painters and one photographer. And that's because I don't have the formal skills. I don't have the evaluation of the cultural heritage that anybody who makes work comes up against. Even, you know, even a punk artist who says, I'm not influenced by the past, is responding to the past when they say that. They make that youthful assertion. And therefore, I'm taxed in different ways. So, for instance, I've got this stanza that I'm kind of having a love affair with. You know, it's, it's walked off on me, it's stumped me, but I'm still in love with it. <laughs> and then the composer comes to me and says, you know, I had to cut that. It just it kind of wasn't working. And I'm like, what? <laughs> You know, so there are personal challenges on that level. You know, you have to slay your darlings, and when you're collaborating, you have to watch the other person slay your darlings, which is much harder. But also, you get a sense of opportunities for the work, the writing, in my case, that you weren't aware of without the other person. What what they do just by following their craft and their muse is they open up opportunities for you, and these aren't just opportunities for audience, by the way. These are opportunities for the work itself. They can actually recast the work and almost make it new and make the author have a new apprehension of what he or she has done. And that is exciting, for me anyway. <clears throat> do you do collaborations? No, I've never really thought about it, actually. Mm. don't know if I'd want to. <laughs> is it because you're self-contained or self mm, I suppose so. Yeah. Both. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, when a, when a, when you're when you're writing and when you're painting, you, but when it's all done and it might be showed, just sort of hung or pre presented, then what happens to it? Have you got a <coughs> great big uh, storehouse somewhere with all your work, or or when it's sold, are you happy to let it go to some other home? Um, I did have a big storehouse, got but it. I'm sort of rebuilding it now, which has been you know, it's great to have this year, to have a space and start stacking up the yeah. work again, and for selling some too. Yeah. But, um, with the installations I make a lot of the time, they're made for a specific space, so they um, don't really get made again, they get broken they apart. And so is that is that, that creative process of creating an installation, which requires you know an emotional attachment, when that's then destroyed or taken apart, mm -hmm. What does that do to you? I mean, it's something that you've created that then you've gotten rid of. You uh, don't have any, it's gone. It doesn't no? bother me because I you know, I always know that it's for a specific space and you know, I won't remake okay. it. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And what about when you've created something and you sell it? Is that, is that a, a letting go? Ah, uh, sort of. I am quite bad at holding on to things. Okay, yeah. 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 But with an author, it's sort of different. You've got the work forever. You've got the, you've got the the record, and you and when it's if it's successful and it's sold, you've still got the original. I mean, you've still got it in your own ownership as well. Yes, and you you tend to license when you do sell things. You don't give away. So when someone buys a painting, uh, my understanding of copyright law is the painter retains the right to the use of the image, but the actual painting is on the wall of Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and they paid for it, and actually if they feel like cutting it up with a bandsaw, they can. And you as the artist can't do anything about it. Well, I'm sure that a number of my readers tear pages out of my books and I'm disgust, but that's fine, because I've got another book. Yeah. But even if all the books are destroyed, I've still got the original. Yeah. And there is a curious notion of original here because um, the only original is really in my handwriting and, and only a few things that I've ever written are now in my handwriting. But you're right, I can hang on to it forever. The problem is that actually it's really easy for me to hang on to it forever because no one else is interested anyway. It's not like there are people <laughs> queuing saying, oh, look, I heard you on the radio and could, could I have a copy of that poem? That would be great. So, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So it's the same for you, Leo. Like you, you've got it forever, and it's you don't you don't lose anything by its success by selling it and giving it away, which others may. No. No. It's good. Yeah, but you, but once you've created a, a dance work, it's it's an ephemeral thing. You might have a recording of it, but surely the the a live performance is live, mm. and it has some connection with its audience and the now. Once that's happened, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. Is that a funny thing? Um, it can be very. Yeah, it can be quite a funny thing. Um, usually after a performance, um, I can feel quite low. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all over. Um, <laughs> but I also feel like. Um, I have to trust my body knowledge, um, my muscle memory, and that um, I carry with I carry that choreography with me into the next project, and it's going to inform um, what's to come in the future. And I find that quite exciting. Um, and I also really we're getting to enjoy more and more improvised performances because um, that's just that's another level of um, uh, performing a movement in the moment and then it's gone. It's not something that you can rehearse over and over again um, over a period of time, but you, you have this idea and this concept, um, you come to a show, you perform it, and then it's immediately gone. As soon as you perform it, it's not something that you can easily recreate. So sometimes when you're improvising, um, you think, oh, that was a great move, and then you try and do it again, you just can't. It's just, you just can't, you, it's gone. Um, so I find that really, Really interesting. Yeah. There's a lovely story about Charlie Parker, the uh, jazz saxophonist, and and he had admirers amongst musicologists. And in fact, a musicologist at one live performance taped it with Parker's consent and then transcribed it and uh, showed it to Parker later on. And Parker said, "Don't be silly, I can't play that." <laughs> <laughs> um, and I understand yeah. that, and that's yeah, yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. You, you know, it's like I can't do that again. Yeah. That was a one-off. That was the moment of discovery. Finding the vocabulary and it's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Different in your situation, I guess. You've got the score, but mm. you've also got the live performance and all the recording, so it can sort of live on whenever and however. Yeah, well, musical works are, f are funny things, and that's one of the, the nice things about music, I think. Great things. Uh, is that there's always all of these gaps that appear in the, in the, in the process. It's always mediated. So I uh, write a piece that's notated and for that to have a, a life as a sounding thing it's got to <coughs> go via a performer effectively and it's sort of again you know you have to let go and it goes through this other person or this other group of people and this other process before it gets realized in sound um, and that's uh, I mean that's tough at first but actually I've come to really like that part of the the process I think it's a really kind of unique aspect of, of what I do. Can I just ask a stupid question? Um, no. When, okay, I'll, I'll ask a mildly intelligent one. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. This is the University of Otago. <laughs> feeling very undergraduate. Um, when you compose, to what extent do you hear the music in your head? Like, can you actually write those chords or your notations down? And I've always been curious about that. Is it something where you have to constantly play it out, or can you actually do several minutes worth just in your head? Yeah, uh, no is the short answer. Um, I'm sure some people can just realise things in their head and, and write them down, but I can't. Um, but nor do I need to to create the kind of work that I'm that I, that I make. Um, I could have asked it afterwards. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so okay. That's not a very satisfactory answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, you know, I'm not musical and I thought, how does a composer compose? I guess the other thing to bear in mind is the kind of music that I'm writing. It's often, uh, I'm not thinking in terms of chords and melodies or rhythms. I'm thinking about other kinds of musical parameters. Sure. Um, so I don't, I can't realise it in the same way in my head. I right. can't just, you know, hear it. Well, there's lots of other things going on in music than chords and melodies and rhythms, right? Um, I think people are struggling with that concept. <laughs> Would you like to flesh that out just a little bit more? <laughs> no, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, uh, there's lots of musical, what we might call musical parameters that you might be exploring, and it might, I mean, pitch might not be a consideration. It might just be about a particular kind of sound world or a um, particular kind of texture or a kind of, you know, something else. It doesn't have to be conceived in terms of uh, you know, pitch or rhythm. Yes, okay? yes, because music is actually ordered sound, isn't it? That's all it, in the broadest sense, so it could be any kind of Can sound. be ordered. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> but to be performed, it has to have some kind of a structure to it, because of how a group of musicians who, who you've written something for, there has to be order, surely. You've written something for them to do well, it as a group. ordered in the way you ordered it. Ordered counts, perhaps. Yeah. Or noise musicians might disagree with that. <laughs> Mm, was getting a bit beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's quite interesting because everyone does something so different here, and to try and understand the process, I'm sure they could all talk it through until they're blue in the face, and, and some degree we still wouldn't it. really yeah. know because mm. it's yeah. on your inside. Yeah, that's it. So. Okay, thank you. Well, let's move on. Um, <laughs> I'd like to ask you what you're doing at the very moment. What are you creating during this time, or how many bits are you creating during your time here at the? It, within the fellowship? Um, at the moment I'm quite obsessed with marble um, which is quite expensive <laughs> so um, I've been painting things to look like marble. <laughs> <laughs> what else have you been doing with that marble? Um, well, I was reading I think it was a picture of Dorian Gray and there was a phrase in there marble kisses and so I thought doesn't that sound those two things together as objects, kisses on marble, would be quite beautiful. So I have been, You've been kissing, kissing marble. <laughs> okay. How does that feel? I mean, with lipstick on, so you oh, see. Oh, I see. I see. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I'm in Scape 7 in Christchurch, um, which is a biennial of art in yeah. public space, so yeah. I'm working towards quite a big um, work for that series of works. Yep. Which is very important for Christchurch, isn't it? Mm, especially now. Yeah, yeah. Give it its mojo back. Yeah, yeah. Samuel, uh, what are you doing? Well, I had well, I've recently finished a few things. Um, in fact, a piece that I finished a month or so ago, I went to the first rehearsal yesterday, and it will be performed for the first time in Hamilton tomorrow. Uh, but that's you know that's out of my hands now. Um, I had grand plans to work on some really big pieces this year, make the most of the time to work on some big projects, but I found myself making lots of little things. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a few kind of series of work that I'm doing at the moment, both of which are, are really experimenting with different approaches to notation. So um, one set of works uses effectively found uh, diagrams <coughs> from academic texts, uh, to which effectively present structures, which can then be realised in various ways. Uh, and another sort of series that I'm working on uh, are verbal schools, so just use um, words effectively to communicate with a performer. And it's fascinating to see how hard it is to, to do that, um, but it's, it's a great challenge. Leone, mm. what are you doing? Lots of things. Lots of things? <laughs> um, well, leaving tomorrow, so... Um, the last six months, I have finished one manuscript, which is about 40,000 words. Mm -hmm. And I, just last week, um, I got some positive feedback from Penguin, which is sounding wow. good. But um, good. I will say that with the recent um, merger, which is now Random Penguin, if anyone's following how <laughs> <laughs> it's um, No, it's Penguin Random, isn't it? No, actually, they've just changed it around. Oh, my God. The last oh, yeah, random, random Penguin. Cool. I used to do Random <laughs> Penguin. <laughs> Um, you know, I'll hold my breath because I know enough about the process to mm. say until it's physically in your hand, don't count those chickens. Um, also, there's the piece that I uh, put in as a proposal that I've been working on, and that's for a, the, the term YA means young adult. Um, I tend to say YA, people look at me and go, what? <laughs> um, and that I've been fine tuning that. Um, that is about a girl living in a small town who discovers a, a travelling library and on it she realises that all the books are actually true stories of the people living in her town and it's what she chooses to do with that information and um, of course some things go well for her and some things do not. Um, I'm 
the one that I've just completed um, that was about a boy who believes that the god Tane might be real and about how he tries to curry favour with the guardian of the forest and for what purposes. I finished a picture book manuscript, started and finished, which is based on the um, winter gardens and the idea that a um, gardener lost first prize in the Ellerslie show and out of revenge he's cross-breeding dangerous plants. <laughs> like, um, um, yeah, like lily pads that spray with skunk DNA, things like that, you see. Um, and th th there are many other projects that I'm working on, but we don't have time. <laughs> Uh, I've been doing a range of creative movement classes and they, uh, the participants range from um, support workers, um, people with disabilities and just general members of the community who want to join in um, and they have been a lot of fun, just, just tremendous amounts of fun. Um, I conducted some interviews with support workers which I tran transcribed into writing and uh, I have a, there's five of us who week um, who meet weekly uh, and we've been exploring with how to um, interpret these interviews through movement so that's been a really interesting process um, some of the things we've been doing is um, I'll just I'll print out the interview and just chop it up um, and spread the interview quotes out um, and we will just spontaneously pick one up um, and then move it, the first thing that comes to our head, uh, put it down, pick another one up, move, pick another, pick another one up, move um, and that's evolved into collecting uh, four or five quotes, um, going to a space and creating a spontaneous composition um, and then letting it go and then um, yeah so that's, that's one way I've been looking at it. Another way is uh, creating solos, so um, sort of taking a small story out of one interview and getting the dancers to um, highlight bits, think think about what <coughs> memories come up for them when they read the story, what, what jumps out of them, what are the themes that come up, and finding ways of exp creating their own solo uh, around that. So that's been really, really fun, yeah. I've been working on three projects. Um, I'd like to deal with two of them in this discussion. They're both long poems. They were conceived as long poems. Um, the challenges of long poem are quite different to the challenges of lyric, it seems to me. In a long poem, this practitioner at least needs an advanced lineup of characters. I mean, new characters may come in, but I've got a core set of characters before I know anything about them. I've got a location. I've got a time. I often have a couple of interactions between characters, so it's starting to sound like a novel or maybe a you know, film script or a play. Um, I need that because the formal constraints of the poem uh, will declare themselves based on the character's needs. And if I don't have a sense of characterization at the start, I don't know how I'm going to cast the stanzas, whether are there going to be any stanzas, what metric I'm going to use, what register, what tone I'm looking for. So it, it's kind of like getting orienteering tools ready. You know, I've got the map and I've got the compass. And I sort of know which direction I'm heading, but I don't know what I'm going to find as I head over the hill. I've finished the first of long poems. It's set in the mid to late 19th century. It features a Chinese gold miner who has an affair or relationship. It's, it's called an affair by uh, disapproving relatives, but he has a relationship with a Kaitahu woman. The families of both try to break up the relationship. And uh, disaster, and then triumph. It's very operatic. You know, and that's 30 pages long, so in terms of what most people are writing, novel or short stories, it's a small work, but for me that's, that's actually two and a half months of daily writing and editing and decision making about what stays and what goes out. Second project which I'm working on now is a parallel piece and it's set in Samoa, it's set in the last year of Robert Louis Stevenson's life. When I was a child, Robert Louis Stevenson was my introduction writing. He was the first author I consciously read book after book after book and was thrilled by it. And I was very lucky. I didn't know that I had taste, but apparently I had taste because he is a brilliant formal stylist. There are very few wasted words in Robert Louis Stevenson and if you want to learn how to use syntax as an agent of discovery, you go to Stevenson. Now what do I mean by that? It informs the poem I'm working on now. The way I got a formal vocabulary for this poem is I looked at what Stevenson does with his sentences. And what he does is 
you can't stop reading the sentence because you don't get the key information until the last word. So you're forced to go to the end of the sentence. Whereas in, in more relaxed prose styles, I'm not saying bad styles, just different styles, you kind of got the payoff halfway through the sentence. And you know, the rest is very nice, but you didn't really need to read it. You can't skim Stevenson. And in poetry, you shouldn't be trying to skim at all, especially if you're the writer. So <laughs> I've taken that sentence structure, which sounds like quite a dry thing, and I've put it in the long poem that I'm writing. So even though my formal properties seem to be quite different in some other ways, they've got that Stevenson drive, and that's his signature. And that's my kind of homage to him. And it's a kind of um, indirect one, but because I've set the poem, in Samoa at the time he was there, um, other things are happening that cross-reference. And I hope the whole thing is passionate. I mean, the first thing that I want, if anybody picks up something I've written, is I want them to have an emotional response. I don't want them to just have confusion, which is a kind of emotional response, but I'd like them to have, if they've got confusion, also wonder and inquiry and hopefully a bit of delight. The third project very quickly is finished and it was a straight piece of archaeology. I've been working for eight years um, on the collector poems of Ian Loney. That's done. And the first month of the fellowship let me put the apparatus in place. And that was a check the footnotes, make sure that quotation's accurate. Is that date right? Was he really in that place? Did you transcribe that poem correctly? Um, so that was quite mechanical, but it was really useful to me in finding my way into the fellowship. Because one of the things that worried me after the initial delight of knowing I've got the fellowship. One of the things that worried me is that there were so many heavyweights who'd had it before that I thought I might just gum up, you know, I might actually just be stuck, terrified by what's come before. And having something I knew I could do that was paint by numbers actually helped build my confidence. And so by the second month when I got that, that nailed, I, I felt, you know, more comfortable. I was kind of wandering into the office as if I'd always had this office. You know, I'd always had this opportunity and it helped start the two long parts. Mm, lovely. One really, really interesting thing about the, the fellowships, I think, is that there's no, um, there's no um, expectation, there's no insistence that any of you actually um, produce anything. You're allowed, you can do what you like with, within the fellowship. Is that I'm mean? planning to destroy everything. Before. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> you, don't, um, you don't have to actually produce something specific. I, I have a shot at the Hocken, but I don't know if I have it's to. Com yeah, it's not compulsory. It's not compulsory. I don't think you have to do anything. I don't think so. It's most of the fellows seem, well, most of the Carolyn Plummer fellows seem to have some kind of outcome, but I have talked to other um, past fellows um, about letting go of the pressure of, of producing that's something, because yeah. um, that's something I was really stressed about, and then I realised that actually, particularly in community dance, it's the process that's really important. Mm. Mm. So I let go yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, I did have a guy who's an accountant, I do have a guy who was an accountant say to me, so is the taxpayer paying for this? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I said, do we really need more roads? Um, <laughs> we agreed to disagree, yeah. um, but I think that's one of the cool things about it, mm. that that's obviously an understanding of, I guess, the creative process is that, you know, as you asked, when do you know if it's finished? I mean, it would be terrible if I had to send something to a publisher just because I'd finished a six months yeah. ago, not because yeah. it was ready. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but can I just say something else when you asked earlier about what we were working on? Um, I was wondering about the other people that aren't from Dunedin and whether they found their experience of the city to have in any way influenced because for me this is such a different city to anywhere I've lived and I found the atmosphere it's a, it's a stunning city and the history and the architecture and everything it's seeping in in so many different ways to my wow. stories in fact one I just finished the first draft of began it and finished it here which I had no intention of writing and it came from it's, it's a Dunedin story I hope it gets published it might not but yeah, I, I owe it to my time here. I would not have written it anywhere else. Oh, well, that's interesting. So your creative process has been stimulated because of being in this town. Yeah, for me. Anybody? Um, I guess what I said before about yeah. the walk to the studio. Yeah. Um, and also it's nice to be surrounded by lots of amazing buildings again. Oh yeah, that's of course, from Christchurch. Yeah. Yeah. And having a studio space, mm. which I haven't had for a long mm. time. Mm. So different to, to Auckland. Like I don't want to bag Auckland, okay? <laughs> um, Auckland's got a lot of good things, but um, 
you know, it's compact, it's got this amazing forest right through the centre. Mm. The architecture, even though we have villas in Auckland, they're so unique. Like, I see features in these individual buildings which I've never seen before. Sometimes it's this particular stained glass window or the way a turret's been formed. Mm. Um, and then there's the, the atmosphere between the ocean, the hills, mm. you get these rolling mists and when the sun hits it and it turns gold, it's mm. quite incredible. The bird life, just yesterday I went for a walk and it's all toys and bellbirds and giant wood pigeons <laughs> in your city. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just saying, atmospherically it's strong. No, that's nice. That's nice to hear that. Isn't it? I live in Perukanui, so <laughs> I've, <used> to it. <laughs> I've been there for 10 years and I, I think I have a strong delight and attachment to the place, but what the Burns gives me in terms of geography is an office where I can close the door in good conscience. And, and for most of the last five years, I've actually shared the smallest room of the house, barring the toilet, with two teenage girls who have their computers set up alongside mine. And on each of their computers, there's Skype so they can talk to the boyfriend, and there's the email open, and there's possibly another page that they're looking at that's supposed to be homework, but they haven't done anything for 15 minutes. And then one of them will discover some film star and, and, and she'll trade impressions and go, yeah, he's pretty hot. And I'm trying to kind of eavesdrop on anything that I should know about as a parent, but also do my work. So I've got an office now, and I say hello to my departmental people, and they're pursuing their teaching and research programs as they should, and with diligence and with joy. And I feel I'm in a good supported space. And then I close the door. And I guess the only obligation I feel in terms of not having an obligation to make work is I feel an obligation to the people who applied for the fellowship and didn't get it. Yeah. And I think actually it would be insulting if I just kind of sat there and, and you know, twiddled my thumbs and picked my nose and, and you know, wrote emails. So what I've done is, of course, make work. Also, <laughs> I've got to do something all day. <laughs> I'd like to open it to the floor if anybody would have any questions to any of our fellows. Now, that's not a sexist word, fellows, is it? I've got a, a general question, and that relates to the discussion about the creative um, process. This is tied up with how you respond if you're commissioned to do something. Because my feeling was that your responses were all quite inward in the way you go about doing mm. things. But if any of you have been commissioned to do something, that must have to change your stance. Mm. And does it? And have you? Mm -hmm. I d at the beginning of the year, before I took the fellowship, I uh, did a workshop series here at the Art Gallery uh, in response to a photographic exhibition. And it's probably the first time that I've been paid to uh, produce something um, other than finding funding myself for my own projects and yeah that was a really interesting process actually because I had a very short amount of time to workshop with a group of dancers and come up with a performance um, and it was something that didn't come from a, my own internal idea but something I had to respond to externally in the photographs so um, yeah I guess um, I just tried to draw on choreographic process that I'd done in, in the past and and do my best to respond to the photos and work collaboratively, collaboratively with the dancers who are participating and, and their impressions of the photographs. Um, so it, yeah, it was a really interesting, an interesting process. Yeah. Yeah, I would say about half of the work I do is commission, commissioned work. Um, but for a composer, usually that involves uh, being given a duration and maybe a particular instrumentation. And it's not very often that you there's too much more that you have to um, that you have to worry about. But I, I mean, I think it's a good thing to have those constraints. It's actually it gives you something to work with, gives you something to work against. Um, in some ways, I see my practice as a kind of problem-solving activity all the time, and so having those constraints is a really useful thing. All of that said, I found recently that uh, working on some of the commissions, I've been working on things that I can't do exactly what I feel like I need to be doing right at that moment, and that's a little frustrating, but uh, it's, it's nice to be, to be paid and to be asked to make something. Mm -hmm. 
Do you do commission work? Oh, I never really have, but I suppose for SCAPE in some ways that's sort of a commission, although I proposed a project. So um, I haven't really had any constructs to work with. So I'm sort of, yeah, I'm getting paid, but I'm doing what I want to do. Sure, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Ellie. The, um, I was just thinking as you were all speaking about your need to make art or what Ellen DeSnaiki might say, biological need to create um, that we all have in one way or another, particularly those who identify as being artists. But I was just also wondering, is there, is there some broader purpose? Uh, is there something that in, in the making that you actually feel the need to share? rather than just keep it in the closet or make it for your own self. It, it seems to me that art is about communicating. So it's a general question. Does anyone actually make something that for, the, for some broader, broader purpose than just the need to make? I make work so that I can understand. And um, you heard me say that my first reader was myself. That again is just a logical description. I mean, I'm always careful to say, look, this isn't just an assertion of faith. This is actually just a logical necessity. I am the first auditor. <coughs> so everything is filtered through me necessarily. And the work will exhibit in some sense the weaknesses of perception that I have. But it is in the nature of language that it will extend beyond my personal perception. You know, in a sense, the work is much bigger than the person who makes it, if it's successful in any way. And in that sense, it's social. And it assumes in the making that other people will be able to attach themselves to it for their own purposes, purposes that actually the maker doesn't have to approve of or know about, so that he can give assent or deny it. As T.S. Eliot said, um, you know, when he read poems for recordings, he said, well, that was one way of reading it. That's a way that I heard it as the maker, but actually there are other legitimate ways of reading it. That doesn't mean that you can construct um, multiple readings that are all accurate from a text. I mean, some readings will be demonstrably wrong, which is, of course, what some of my colleagues have to demonstrate to first years. But there are a number of readings that are demonstrably OK. OK is weak. But it's social. It's up for discussion. But I guess this idea of a, of a, of a, a broader purpose or something that you, you know, a reason for making that involves wanting to convey an idea or share something for others, or for the greater purpose of the planet, perhaps? I think I do that. Um, I often want to try and communicate an idea, or um, I have often made works um, about my experience of being part of the queer community. Um, and so, for instance, the Fringe Festival, uh, I did queer deportment with some colleagues, and that was all about reclaiming space, reclaiming public space, um, and sort of saying, we're here, you know, um, we're not invisible. Um, and, you know, I think my motivations for working uh, with the support work community was uh, this idea that it's a career that's undervalued in our society. And again, I wanted to explore the, um, explore this career and explore what it's, what it's all about and, and sort of, in some ways, maybe demonstrate the importance of the work. So in that way, yeah, yep, definitely. I was just thinking a few things. Um, one is, when I write for children, I'm aware that a children's book is always a good thing. It's almost inherent in itself because of the fact that it's very rare to get an unhappy ending in a children's book. Plus, um, <laughs> well, it's, it's part of the form almost. You can do it, but it's difficult. Um, and I get the sense of creating, this is going to sound so cheesy, um, I don't do this on purpose, but it's creating little bubbles of happiness that you just send out because I remember the experience of reading myself. And I am writing for myself, but I'm also, again, I have an awareness of audience without writing for the audience. And when I put it out there, though, I have the comfort of knowing that if I formed my bubble correctly, <laughs> it's only going to float out into the world and it'd be something that can be enjoyed by others. But in terms of a, a bigger, overarching purpose, I will say that as a person, I have different dimensions to me and different things that interest me. Something that I recently completed, the Dear Tane one, does pull in issues like Treaty of Waitangi. Um, but I did not sit down to do that. And I, I really feel strongly that no creative person has an actual responsibility as such to do so. 
I think that because you cannot determine where the creative process begins, and once you start, if you start on a topic or an issue, you might create something that's very intelligent, but will you touch someone here, if you know what I mean? And so if what you're writing comes from here and it happens to embrace issues which will make the world a better place, that's fantastic. Having said that, I just recently heard, read an article by Mandy Hager, in which she was encouraging other writers to be more socially conscious. And I did think, in 20 years, you know, I've had more life experience, will I have a different view? So ask me in 20 years. Thank <laughs> <laughs> okay. you. Yes. I had a question for um, Leonie about the Dunedin story. I was wondering what elements in it make it something that you couldn't have written anywhere else. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't like to talk about the story in too much detail because it is still new and this is a hard thing to explain but until something is fully formed in my mind I've done thorough rewrites I won't have the ownership over it and once I've got that then I can discuss it like it's objective and away from me um, but it's set in the Dunedin Botanical Gardens right down to the details of some of the trees um, so simply within that physical context again I'll say something cheesy <laughs> um, and that is that I've got a real sense of possibility inside the garden there is something that I tried to put my finger on all I can say it's a place where I, I feel that something impossible might meet me around the corner of the bend you know and when I try to find out what that is I've literally sat there in those gardens waiting for a story and going over and over my notes it took me a couple of months because I thought maybe I won't find it here um, and in the end it was different aspects that all joined together and it just turned out that I had the perfect setting um, and that was it, it was the gardens. But when I see that it comes in on many you know, nuanced levels, um, I'm a big fan of atmosphere, um, it just kind of soaks in. So I really think that it'd be hard to pinpoint in other stories, outside of that one which is clearly set in Dunedin right down to the weather. Um, the weather's good here. I don't know if people are complaining. It's cold, <laughs> but it's great. Um, you know, like I said, the architecture. Um, I've got one story that I've been playing around with for a long time, which I've yet to write. I'm just letting it percolate. And I knew it would involve the renovation of an old house. Well, look where I am. <laughs> and I've met people that I can now contact and say, tell me about, you know, how did you tear apart those pieces of your house and rebuild them? Visually, it's a very stimulating place. And I think it's got a real connection, obviously, to the Scottish roots. And as a result, no, I can't actually put my finger on this. So I wanted to say something which I can't actually express, which is why I like to write things down and then rewrite them <laughs> <laughs> so I can get them right. It's simply a sensation, and a sense of atmosphere. Yeah. Mm. Any more questions from anyone? If not, oh yes. <laughs> Just a, a broad question to all the fellows. In what way do you think this time here uh, in the fellowship will change things forward? What difference will it, it have made, do you think, moving forward? To the world? To, to, the, to them as, yes. as, as, as artists. As, as artists. Do I understand? I hope that it um, opens up more possibilities for me, uh, opens some doors perhaps um, into um, more fellowships or scholarships, <laughs> uh, but also just the opportunity to um, have that time to explore my creative process more and um, have the time to really uh, delve deeply into what I love doing and and often I find I'm having to work full time and, and dance around the edges so having that the space to be able to do to dance full time um, I think will really help me consolidate um, my skills and my process as a dancer. Samuel challenged me to use the, the term whack jobs. And here's my last <laughs> opportunity. So I think that I think that the people that by and large make decisions for most of the population are whack jobs. Okay, they value money and trade above emotional and intellectual well-being. 
the arts, it seems to me, have an inherently political dimension which has nothing to do with preaching and it has nothing to do with activism. The arts are active and they promote a sense of person. Now, I don't think you can write for the people, by the way. I'm not about producing propaganda, but I'm always writing for the person. That means the individuated, to borrow a term from Jung, person. The person who is trying to develop their sense of what it is to be in the world. And when I write, I write as a four-year-old who's <coughs> discovering language, as a 16-year-old who's discovering sex and the notion of career, as a 24-year-old who's just come out of a relationship and become a father, as someone who's stewarding his way through business relationships, I bring all of those things to every sentence I write. And I hope that somewhere out there, other people in reading what I write will occasionally, I don't take it as a given, will occasionally see an opportunity for themselves in their lives that they hadn't seen before they read me. And I think that's what reading does, by the way. And I think it's what looking at paintings and going to dance and listening to music does for people. And that's why, very shortly after human beings discovered fire in every recorded civilization, they discovered song and dance. They didn't discover capitalism, that's a recent thing. <laughs> and they certainly didn't print money and say, yeah, have that. And they didn't run up debts with one another. And they didn't do basically whack job stuff. Very good. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, I was just going to say it's hard to know. It's actually just hard to know because um, this is the only fellowship in the country for a children's author, so I, I don't see it leading to others. <laughs> um, and it's simply a case of waiting to see where these stories go because um, publishing in New Zealand in the last two to three years is, is a very different landscape. Um, various things such as the impact of Amazon and ebooks and uh, the recession all compiling into one very interesting mm -hmm. situation. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, it's the echo of, of a bell, you know, the bell's been rung, how will it sound 10 mm. years from now? Will I still hear it? And I, I think I will. Mm. Do you want to say anything? Uh, yes, I guess I, w I would actually prefer to come back to your question, if that's okay. I'm, I've been pondering it a little. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess I'm also a little concerned about the way we've got caught up talking about right, making work for ourselves. Um, and I mean, my, my music doesn't have any kind of message or agenda as such, but I think that um, the work that I create requires a certain kind of engagement, sort of d determined engagement to, um, for it to work for, for someone. And that in itself is automatically a kind of do, it's doing something quite important, I think. Um, it provides a kind of um, challenge, perhaps, or a, even a critique of um, what most music does. Um, and also, I mean, I think you could extend that beyond thinking about music as well. And I, so I think that it, it does do something bigger, you know, it's not just about me. It's, it does something much bigger than that, potentially. Um, there's this idea that that was uh, put forward some years ago now. There was a debate here about uh, artists as profits. Do you remember that debate, Nicholas? Um, were artists profits? Or, and I think yeah. that it, what you've said connects with that a little bit. You know. um, is there some, and what you said also connects with that idea that, that uh, whether you're perhaps totally conscious of it or not, what you put out into the world can be life-changing for somebody. Yeah, and that was what I was thinking when I was looking at those children's faces. <laughs> yeah. I suddenly thought about the impact of what I was writing. But I also thought, um, I have to see where that thought takes me. Do you know what I mean? I'm very much starting out, and whether in five to ten years, I'm just wary of saying something, then ten years I'm going to completely contradict. That's okay. So, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Any further questions? Another one. One to David. David, in the act of creation, which you've explained that sometimes you do under difficult circumstances, do you take an extent, some degree of pleasure in it? And when you come to the end, does it give you joy? I often actually feel disappointed when I come to the end, and I'm actually picking up on something that 
Hannah talked about after a performance, you know, that there's a kind of low. Well, as something's coming to an end, um, what I'm starting to incarnate, big word, but I stick with it, is, is a fear of not being able to do anything else. So I kind of want to stay with the thing I know I can do. Mm. I don't want it to end. You know, that's part of the sense of being dumped, having the work walk off on me. I take great pleasure once I'm in the middle of a work. Starting work I hate. Um, it's simply, there are so many ways the work could go, and what I'm doing primarily is listening. Now, what is the act of listening? Listening is an attempt to make the silences between words active, okay? It, what do I mean by that? I mean that you take note of the words that you've got, but what's happening in the silence? Because that's where the next line comes from. It doesn't come from the word on either side, it comes from the bit in between. That's what I have to fill out. So it's about listening, and it's exhausting. But once I'm in the middle, I'm not suggesting everything flows beautifully. I've got a good sense. You know, I know that character wouldn't say that. And I know they wouldn't use that word. And I know that their relationship with this character is going to change here. I don't quite know how intense that change is going to be until I hit the passage. But, you know, I've got more sense of being familiar. And it is like going for a walk. It's like I'm now in this field and I know there's a stile over there. But actually, if I go out that way, I'm going to have to push down the barbed wire fence and be careful I don't tear my trousers. It is actually a sense of geographical, almost, familiarity when I'm in the middle of a piece of work. So I, I have a vested interest in keeping work going as long as I can once I've started it, and I have a horror of starting anything new. And at the same time, a fear that I won't be able to start something new, which is part of the horror, of course. Horror or joy of being an artist. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. I'd like to um, salute the University of Otago for establishing and maintaining the fellowships here in Dunedin. Um, it's not an easy task to, to um, keep these things going when in actual fact uh, there's um, money is spent on other priorities according to other people. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank David and Hannah and Leonie and Samuel and Zena for, their, for being with us here this afternoon. Um, Linda and Johnny for looking after us here at the DPAG. And uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, do join us for afternoon tea now. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Is I'm it? just about to put it out. Uh, okay. <laughs> so so now-ish. Thank you all for coming and thank you fellows. <laughs>